Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrei Vlasovsky. Uh, a few words about me. I'm from St. Petersburg, Russia. I'm the technical lead of PyCharm. I work for JetBrains. Here is a number of open source project, op projects that I'm maintaining. And I've also been contributing to the uh, typing peps uh, for Python type system. But today we are going to be talking about Python 3.8. As you may know, it is going to be released uh, uh, in October this year, and the uh, second beta is actually available. You can go to the python.org website, download it, and play with the new features, about which I will tell you today. Actually, there are very good docs on what's new in Python 3.8. They go into details about all the new syntax, all the new additions to the standard library, all the new stuff related to performance of the CPython interpreter, all the major bugs that were fixed there, and so on. And I am not going to be uh, retelling this document, because I just don't see any sense in uh, just re reciting documentation, uh, telling what's there, and so on. So the best thing for you to do is just to go to via this link and look into the features, all the bits that you are interested in. So this is not what we are going to be discussing today. Uh, what we will be discussing is the story behind some of the features of 3.8. I will tell you their history, how they appeared, and what are the pros and cons of the new features of 3.8. Also, I will give you a small overview of some features that might come in the future versions of Python beyond 3.8. Well, I said some features. Well, yes, some, because there are just too many of them, and I cannot tell you all about every uh, single feature. So I've chosen some features that I like or I don't like for this talk, but I'll do my best to um, try to stay objective. Uh, but I'm only half human, half Vulcan, so you know, it may not work out as I expected. Well, actually, uh, Spock was half. Welcome as well. Well, no, not forget it. Uh, okay, let's start with the new syntax because it's something that always catches your eye when you look into the new syntactic changes to your language. Uh, let's start with assignment expressions, maybe the most famous feature of 3.8. Uh, everybody is talking about it. It's the new walrus operator because, because this assignment expression looks like a little walrus. Uh, here's an example, just to give some context. Uh, I guess everyone is familiar with the regular expression module. Everyone uh, has written code like that, only uh, you usually put the assignment for the M match on a separate line. And now it can be a more compact like that. All right, so this is what we are talking about. But the initial pep was quite a bit different. Uh, in the initial pep, the syntax was uh, that you had to use the required parentheses around your expression, assignment expression, and instead of this new assignment operator, you would use actually the as uh, uh, keyword. Uh, so this was like the initial proposal. Also in the initial proposal, there was this idea of sublocal scopes, meaning that these variables, these names that you introduce via these assignment expressions are local to the statement in which you have assigned them. For example, in our previous case, for the match, the M name uh, would be available only in the if statement, and not beyond uh, after this if statement. Uh, and uh, since in Python we have only uh, sc scopes only for functions and for classes and for modules, uh, it required actually some, some name mangling in order to be able to put it into already existing infrastructure for holding names for local scopes of functions. So the idea was that these names were somehow mangled and put into the uh, locals dictionary so that you cannot access them directly after you get out of the scope for this uh, assignment expression. After the PEP was, the draft of the PEP was published into Py inside Python dev mailing list, uh, it got a lot of attention of various developers, including a lot of Python core developers, and there were a number of changes proposed to this PEP. Uh, also, Guido van Rossum became interested in this PEP, and some of these additions were proposed by, by him. Uh, for example, uh, this walrus operator appeared instead of S, because S is already used in three different contexts. In the context of importing things, in the context of catching exception in the accept clause, and also in the context of the with statement. 
and since uh, in every one of these cases S means a bit uh, different thing, uh, uh, the authors of the PEP proposed to use this new operator for that. This operator comes from ancient languages like Pascal and so on. Uh, also, it was decided to drop the parentheses, at, at least in some cases, and to introduce more uh, regular scoping rules uh, without this name mangling thing. So the names uh, are still available after your statement with these assignments expressions are, is executed. Uh, also, since now uh, parentheses are not uh, a required thing, uh, the PEP authors had to deprecate the, uh, the, uh, the usage of these assignment operator at the statement level. So you cannot write, for example, x uh, borrows operator 2. You can, uh, you can only use your regular uh, equals as, uh, uh, expression for that, because otherwise you would have had two different ways to do things well, for, for one of the most basic cases of uh, using Python. Uh, another thing that, uh, is, uh, that, that was required for this PEP was uh, scoping rules for comprehensions. In uh, list comprehensions, dict comprehensions, and uh, any other type of comprehension, uh, the names introduced in the, in, inside the four here are actually local to this comprehension in Python 3. But for uh, assignment expressions, it was decided to allow these names to be usable after the comprehension is executed in order to basically allow this pattern of usage where I want uh, to use uh, this assignment expression inside the any function. So I want here to know if any of the lines in this list of lines starts with the hash sign. And for that, I really often uh, need to know the exact line that starts with the hash. And this nice syntax allows us uh, to basically grab this line and to use it uh, further in, the, uh, the, in, your, in your code. So, uh, it resulted in a quite large PEP with a lot of stuff going on, and many of these things were quite controversial. Some people liked the idea of assignment expression, side people don't like it. Uh, so, there was this like, dispute about whether it was to be a part of Python or not. And Guido decided that uh, it's still a good idea to accept this PEP, uh, even though uh, the authors of the PEP had to add a section about the importance of real code right in the beginning of the PEP, uh, stressing the importance of examples that are typically that typically occur in your code, uh, compared to uh, some complicated examples you can come up with if you think how you can abuse this new operator. But it's still helpful in many practical contexts, like the one I, uh, the ones I I've sh I, I show here. For example, to emulate something like do while that we don't have in Python yet, or think, uh, the thing I wanted always uh, to be able to capture the if part of a list comprehension and use it further in my comprehension expression. It's, I think it's a useful thing. So uh, after accepting this PEP, Guido decided to step down from his role as BDFL, I guess because he was too tired with this uh, controversy uh, around this PEP. And also, it's something, it was something that he was already thinking about. For example, he announced it at some PyCon US, I guess it was in Montreal several years ago, that he, will eventually, he would eventually step down from his, his role as BDFL. And now, after some discussions, we now have a new governance model for the Python language, the Python Steering Council. I wouldn't go, won't go into much detail here, because it's not the subject of my talk. This is the PEP number that describes the process. So, to summarize, there are some upsides of the new operator. It makes it more compact to use assignments in some specific situations that very often occur in your code, like the one with the regular expressions. Uh, also, the current implementation of this uh, PEP, the current proposal, uh, is, uh, ha has a relatively simple semantics. So, if you, don't any, if you don't know anything about the assignment expressions, it's still possible for you to understand uh, what this code does. I guess at least it should be, because the code is quite, quite clear, the meaning of this operator could be obvious from the context, and so on. So it's not like super complicated. But as some downsides, one might say that, that yes, you can definitely come up with a very hacky example for which it will be completely uh, 
obscure what, what's going on. You won't be able to understand it without running the actual code. Yeah, it, it's the case. Okay, and now we have basically two assignment operators in Python instead of one. Well, we could have used the same assignment uh, operator like the uh, single equal sign for that, but it would lead to some issues with parsing and to some issues with assigning to attributes and to expressions that, with subscription indices and so on. Uh, and if you want to know more about Python parsing and how this operator was implemented and so on, uh, I recommend you to watch a video of one of the talks at the current EuroPython by Pablo Salgado, was one of the core developers. Uh, this talk uh, dives deep into the structure of the Python parser, the limitations of its grammar, and what can be done and what cannot be done. The next thing, also related to the new changes in the syntax, positional only parameters. Uh, it looks like that with the slash, uh, and uh, the, oops, sorry, the idea is as follows. Uh, in the Python C API, there were always functions that accepted only positional arguments. For example, this power function, uh, the built-in from, from the standard library, you cannot pass your arguments by name, even though the documentation for this function uh, specifies the, name, the names of the arguments. Just because, well, it's just how it works, how it's implemented in the C API. And for Python, we really didn't have a way to express it in, on the, in the Python language, only in the, as a part of the, your C extension. And people used this workaround to uh, have this star args argument, and then they as, uh, assigned basically the parts of this uh, tuple to specific uh, local variables, which worked, but it was not ideal because uh, it was hard to get uh, what this function did just by looking at its signature, and you had to look into the, the documentation or the implementation of the thing. So now we have, an, have a new syntax where everything that is before this slash separator is actually a keyword, or, I'm sorry, a positional only argument, and everything after the slash is anything else. Uh, keyword or positional or only keyword and so on. But why slash for positional only? Well, it's because in Python we already have this pep that describes uh, so-called argument, argument clean DSL. It's a DSL uh, uh, that defines a preprocessor for writing C extension modules for C Python. And in this DSL, slash is used exactly for this case, for separating positional only arguments, like the ones in the function power, from anything else. And also, the slash what was used, I guess, before in some documentation for built-in functions as well. So for historical reasons, slash seemed like a good way to separate these parameters. But wait, we already have some markers to separate, or at least to uh, uh, define keyword parameters, positional para parameters, and it's, always, uh, it's usually the pattern to call them star arcs, double star keyword arcs, and so on. Why don't we, uh, why cannot we use just them? For example, single star for positional only parameters and double star for keyword only parameters. Well, the reason is that in Python 3.0, or 3.5, we have now, since Python 3.3 or 3.5, we now have these keyword-only arguments, and for them, uh, we use a single star as a delimiter of the parameter release. So the overall scheme for uh, parameters in uh, Python 3.8 looks like that. You have positional-only, slash, uh, keyword or positional, star, single star, and uh, uh, then keyword-only arguments. Uh, the reason for that is backwards compatibility. We cannot just change things to, uh, to use star as a delimiter for positional only arguments because it's already in use for keyword only. But why is star used for keyword only arguments? That's a good question. Actually, the reasoning is described in the PEP that introduced keyword only arguments. And uh, basically, uh, the explanation is there was this uh, workaround how you can use a keyword and only arguments in, say, Python 2. Uh, if you have this star ignore argument, and then you want any other argument after star ignore to be uh, keyword only, you can check if ignore actually uh, um, consumed some of the arguments that you passed to your function. And 
for example, if you pass key not as a key as a keyword argument, but as a position only, it will be consumed by ignore, and you can check if ignore is not empty, and then raise, for example, raise, for example, a type error. So if you remove this word ignore, you get this single star that is used now in Python 3 for separating keyword only parameters from anything else. So to summarize, uh, we now have a consistent situation when we have syntax to, uh, to um, define both positional only and keyword only arguments in Python functions. And it's back backwards compatible, which is always a good thing. And the downside is, yeah, it's, well, not consistent with star arcs and double star keyword arcs, but yeah, it's a compromise. Uh, let's talk a bit about stuff that is not related to new syntactic changes, about new types in the standard library. There are several of them. I won't go into much detail about them, uh, just to mention briefly what they give you. Uh, protocol types give you a way to express basically duct typing in Python. Uh, or uh, if we uh, uh, use the terms from type theory, it's structural typing as compared to nominal typing that we had in Python before. Also, there are literal types that allow you to specify a type of a variable by restricting it to be of, uh, to, to accept certain values of type int or uh, string. Also, there are final types that allow you to, uh, for example, forbid reassigning to a variable or you can define classes of functions that you cannot overwrite later or inherit from later. And also there is type dict uh, that allows you to specify types for specific keys in your dictionaries. Uh, what I wanted to tell you about in, in this part is that where all these ideas about types come from. Well, actually this process is a bit different from what I described previously. Yes, there are PEPs but the ideas actually come from the implementers of specific type checkers. And there is a repository on GitHub where people discuss these new ideas in issues, in GitHub issues. So the process usually looks like that. Uh, some type checker, let's say MyPy, come, uh, comes up with an idea of a new type. And usually this idea comes from uh, some real world uh, code base for which they had issues annotating this code base. So there are some specific uh, situations. And they come up with the new idea of a type and put it into their own module, like MyPy extensions in this case. And later, if this type is interesting, useful, other, the authors of other type checkers, like PyCharm or Pyra, uh, also become interested in this. And uh, after some discussions, uh, these new types um, are moved to the typing extensions module, which is a PyPI package and so on. Uh, but uh, at least it is something that is uh, common for several type checkers, and more and more type checkers start to support new types at this point. And after that, if some type appears to be uh, universally useful, uh, uh, the authors of this extension come up with a PEP draft, and then the regular PEP process takes place, and after that, things uh, are being moved to the typing module. To summarize the new additions, now we have more cases for, uh, uh, more types that cover more cases of the real world code bases, like the one at Dropbox, where uh, the MyPy team actually uh, actively annotates stuff with, uh, with the help of MyPy. Uh, but the downsides are that the typing module is becoming larger and larger, and it's hard to learn about Python types it's becoming harder. And also, I would say that it's not always necessary to put stuff into the standard library, especially if it's only used actually by a type checker, with, which is not a part of CPython distribution anyway. Uh, also, I can recommend you to watch, uh, to watch this video from this EuroPython by Vita Schmid uh, about uh, static typing beyond the basics. I guess in this talk uh, there will be mentions of types I just described. So now let's talk a bit about stuff that isn't coming into Python in, in Python 3.8. Something that is currently being discussed or even implemented, but it didn't make it to the point when the Python uh, the, when the feature freeze uh, occurred for Python 3.8. Uh, the first like cluster of things I wanted to mention are the new ideas about the evolution of typing in Python. There are several proposals. Some of them are already pep drafts. 
and uh, most of them are about usability issues uh, of the Python type system. You know, many people complain that the type system of Python is really messy uh, because it was something that wasn't there from the beginning and there were limitations, syntactic limitations and others. Uh, so uh, now it's like you have to import a lot of stuff. For example, you, you have to import from typing the uppercase list just to express that you have like a list of int. And there are a few PEPs that allow uh, that, that propose to clean up the situation. One of them proposes to use the newly introduced Dunder class get item method to add actually this uh, square brackets operator for the built in classes like list or uh, set or whatnot, uh, instead of compared to, for example, not introducing Dunder get item on the, its their classes, meaning uh, meta classes of uh, the actual lists, uh, the class type because other, uh, in this case, every object in Python would have this Dunder get item and so on. So this is Dunder class get item to overcome this limitation. Also, there are some ideas how to uh, make it easier to use by not requiring a, a programmer to actually import things from the typing module. So there is this idea since type hints can already be evaluated only statically via the new from future import. Uh, import annotations. Uh, there is this idea to switch all the syntax of uh, Python type hints, uh, of P Python typing to use type hints that are evaluated only statically by static type checkers. <coughs> In that way, it won't be necessary to actually import anything, and you can just uh, specify something that is only there for static type checkers and that doesn't affect uh, your, for example, performance of your runtime when you run your code in Python. And also there are other, other ideas as well in this area. Another area when, where there are some possible changes coming up in the next releases is the area of asynchronous programming, async await. The idea is to introduce so-called structured concurrency for async IO tasks. Uh, um, the idea is simple. When you run an async IO task, you don't really control it, and it's hard to control it when, it when it's going to be finished, how you catch exceptions from this task, and so on. And so uh, one of the core developers, uh, uh, Nathaniel Smith, uh, introduced this library called Trio, where you can actually define so-called nurseries that spawn tasks, and their scope, uh, uh, they, their scope of life is limited to this block where the nursery is active. If anything bad happens to one of the tasks, the nursery will wait for all the tasks to finish, and then you'll have like a multi-exception that combines all the possible exceptions from all the tasks in the, in the scope, and you can be, will be able to handle the situation in a clean way. This is uh, something that is comparable to the classical issue of the go-to statement that, as you know, consider, is considered harmful, but uh, the title of, the, of Nathaniel's paper was the go statement considered harmful. Go is a statement of the language Go that allows you to spawn coroutines in an uncontrolled manner. So the idea is to have this structure like with whiles and ifs and so on that replaced the go to. The idea is to have similar like structured patterns but for launching asynchronous tasks. And I would also recommend you to watch a talk from this EuroPython by Lynn Root uh, where she uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, Trio-like nurseries. Uh, and there are also a couple of things I would like to tell you about performance. Uh, one of the projects that I'm personally looking forward to is MyPyC. It's something that could make your single core uh, Python applications run faster by basically compiling them to C with a lot of calls to C extension APIs. Uh, but the idea is a bit different from what Cython does. In Cython, you are basically adding more C types to convert your Python program into a Cython program with just a different syntax. Whereas in MyPyC, the idea is that you limit yourself in your use of Python metaprogramming, monkey patching, and so on. So your structure of your, object uh, of your objects become, becomes more static. And also, it, uh, you are required to use type hints basically everywhere for your code. So it's like a stricter 
more statically typed subset of Python. And if, if, if you restrict yourself to this subset, then MyPyC promises, at least initially for some cases, to give you like five X performance boost or something like that. And it's actually already there in some production scenarios. For example, MyPyC, as you might have guessed, the name comes from the type checker MyPy, uh, and MyPyC is written by the members of the MyPy team, and they have created this project to make MyPy run faster, and this is the result they got, like 5x, 5x performance boost, and it's already there in the current version of MyPy. So if you are using MyPy, you already have this kind of technology working on your laptop. Also, there is the idea of sub-interpreters, but I won't go into much detail here, because today we had a keynote about Python performance uh, by Victor Stinner that had a part about sub-interpreters, and in general, it was a, a very interesting talk that touched a lot of areas about Python performance. So I would really recommend you to watch uh, his video if you haven't attended uh, the keynote today. So, a bit about the release plans. As you might know, the Python 2 is going to be retired uh, on the 1st of January 2020. Uh, 3.8, as I said, will be released in a few months. And 3.9, uh, it's, I guess it's not clear yet. At least uh, maybe, uh, maybe this information is already outdated, but there was an idea of uh, switching to nine month release cycles. So Python 3.9 might appear sooner than you expect. So, in conclusion, I really recommend you to install Python 3.8 beta, try it by yourself, try the new features, see if you like them or not, and try to run your production code uh, in some environment, at least testing environment, uh, to see if there are any uh, incompatibilities, and please report anything you find to the Python bug tracker, and help with fixing bugs, with, uh, with coming up with new ideas for the next Python releases, and so on. And also I should mention then that all the features of Python 3.8 I was talking about today are available in one of the beta builds of PyCharm 2019.2. Uh, I guess this concludes my presentation. Thank you. All right, uh, we have Time for a few questions. So we have two sets of microphones over there. Please line up and fire away. Hello, is this working? Okay, great. So I, I'm the author of Argument Clinic, and you might be wondering why slash in the first place. Um, I use slash for indicating positional linear arguments in Argument Clinic because this was a syntax proposed by Guido von Rossum on the mailing list before when we were, people were talking about uh, positional linear arguments. And you may be wondering, okay, why did Guido propose it? And the answer is because it's kind of like multiplication and division operators, like one is the opposite of the other. That was really only his thought. Cool. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, hi. Nice speech. Uh, I wanted to ask you the question about uh, uh, do you know the plans? Uh, will uh, be the question operator similar that we have in C Sharp or Java? Uh, there are pep drafts about that, maybe even two, that uh, t t talk about this chain of nullity checks. Uh, but as far as I know, they are not pushed forward at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are you, the core de developers at all thinking about uh, uh, the size of the syntax of Python? Uh, over Python 2, we have very few additions to the language, whereas we're seeing more and more with the new versions. Yeah, and but Python it, 2 is like... It's actually hard. I teach Python, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get through the entire syntax of Python in mm -hmm. a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely the case that uh, it's harder to learn Python 3 than Python 2, because the language is just bigger. But I should mention that Python 2 is, uh, I guess, 11 years older than Python 3, and Python 3 just lived a lot longer, so it acquired more and more features. If Python 2 uh, uh, 
would have changed beyond Python 2.7. I guess there would be some new additions. But yeah, yeah, I agree that is the problem, and this is one of the things I mentioned about typing, even though it's not related to syntax. But yeah, I guess it's an issue. All right, let's uh, thank Andre again. Thank you.